Shalom and welcome to another edition of Our Daily Bread, where we discuss the weekly Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is the seventh parashat of the book of Bereshit, and it's called Vayetze, which means uh, any win out. And my message is that I'm doing here, I'm catching up my some older messages that I wrote, but I hadn't recorded a video yet. And so this is going to be my message from 2006-7 called Be Fruitful. And in this week's parashat, we see uh, we see about we really see three main concepts that happen in this week's parashat. Okay, we start with this vision of the ladder and and angels going up and down from the ladder, and then we see the flocks gathered around the well, and and the little story of him moving the rock and kissing Rachel, and watering her flocks, um, and then. We get into the, uh, you know, the birth issue where uh, we have barrenness and Rachel is barren. She's trying to have kids. And then the battle between her and Leah on who's going to have kids, who's going to be fruitful and uh, I'm more fruitful and pleasing to their husband. So that those three things are the foundations that we have to pick apart and we have to look at and we have to say, um, you know, what do those mean? What, what, what does it mean to be fruitful? What does it mean to, um, to, uh, you know, how's that play in the context of this story? What is the story trying to tell us about being fruitful? So we'll start with the meaning of fruitful, which is, uh, the word para and uh, in Hebrew, uh, the word para spelled pe resh he, um, which in the ancient Hebrew, the pictographs, they each, each letter has a meaning, would, would, could mean open mouth, beginning, reveal. And it's important that I always like to start with a key word, uh, and, and, you know, something that's a linchpin that really uh, draws everything together. And then in observing that and, and examining that word, you can see how powerful. Remember, this, this Torah is a document of words. And the words, and the world was created by words. Words have power. And, and they have power when we have to understand them. We have to look at them a little deeper and say, what is that relevance uh, in the scriptures? Just like stories. You know, the, the odd thing is, is like, why did I need to know about the latter? What is the relevance? I mean, sure, they told us that it happened, but they didn't really tell us, you know, why or what's the relevance. It's the same with knowing why there was three flocks uh, by the well. Why did it matter who else was by the well? At the end of the day, it was about him finding Rachel. You didn't need to tell me. You could have said there were flocks. You didn't have to tell me there was three. Every piece of information has value and has something there. It's just like when Mashiach spoke in parables. Each one of those words had an alternate definition, uh, a spiritual definition and, and a symbolic representation uh, that were right under there. So you can't just leave out in the parable of the wheat and the tares. You couldn't just say, well, there was there was a harvest by not discerning that there was there was some wheat and some tares, some children of Elohim, some children of Satan. You lose out on all that. So we have to learn to start looking at these um, uh, scriptures and understanding that there's nothing superfluous, that everything has meaning. So we have to observe before we try to come to conclusions about it. We have to observe each item and say, what is it? Why is it that way? What's its purpose? And look into it and then say, now do I see anything now that I've laid it all out in front of me um, that that is jumping out at me? Um, so we start with this word para, and and it says open mouth beginning revealed. Now the first thing that you'd notice is that open mouth, uh, a well, the 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 opening is called the the mouth of the well. So uh, even we got last week's parashat about the whole story about filling the wells in with dirt, which would be closing the mouths, uh, and then and then the water is that uh, life giving word. Um, and so, so we see open mouth beginning revealed, and we say, okay, what is the context of this? What does this have to do with this? Obviously, the the open mouth, the words, and the beginning revealed. So this is about fruit and being fruitful. So what does it mean? Because because Adam was told to to be fruitful and multiply, and we're going to see in this week's parashat that that this big struggle with Leah and Rachel and, and, and ultimately with Yaakov, what was happening in his family was this struggle about being fruitful. And, and then when we look in the broader scope, we see the story of Ephraim and, uh, and, and the 10 tribes 
uh, of the uh, northern house and Yehuda, uh, the two southern tribes, uh, we see this same concept. Why is Ephraim called the fruitful? What is this about the fruitful that has gone away uh, because of their wickedness and they're forgetting everything and then they're going to come back? And how are they going to come back? What is that fruitfulness? How is that fruitful? Um, and so all this stuff plays in together. And we can learn some of this from this week's parasha. Now, the first thing we'll talk about is the ladder. What does the ladder mean? He sees the vision of the ladder going up to heaven. And there's angels ascending and descending. And and the first thing I ask is, what is an angel? And it's a servant or messenger of Elohim. And why are they ascending and descending. Well, one interpretation may be that that uh, when we look at ascending and, and descending, we see two things. Number one, ascending is typically a positive thing. Um, descending or, or being brought down low or being cast down, uh, coming down low, it, it can mean humility, but typically a lot of times it's it's uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. And as a matter of fact, uh, when you look at it in relationship, it says, why did they tell us that Yodewahe was on uh, above the ladder? Well, why do we need to know his position in relevance to people ascending and descending? And what I think it is, is it's because with Yodewahe here, if you're descending, you're moving away from Yodewahe. If you're ascending and he's at top, you're moving closer to him. And so we see this concept that disobedience separates us from Elohim and obedience draws us closer to him and so what we see is as servants of yod are constantly in this state of making choices where they're either drawing those choices are drawing them closer to Elohim to be one with him or further away and separating them and so we start with this concept of this ladder and then we go to the flocks now what are these flocks the flocks it tells us there's three flocks and that the stone, so when we get to the remez or the spiritual definitions, right? Like Mashiach said, the weed is the children of God. These are spiritual definitions. This is what I call the remez. A little different than the Jewish understanding of remez, which they think is just there's a hint in the text that there's something more there. Um, to me, the remez is actually the, the specific spiritual definition that this also equals this. And so... So when I say the remez, we say, what is the, uh, what is a stone, right? What is the stone that's on the mouth of the well? A stone typically is, in remez, is a truth. And, and it's something that's hard and it's solid. Uh, it's established. And so, so a person could look at this and say, there's a truth on the mouth of the well that is stopping the, uh, that, that, essence has to be removed um, for for people to be nourished with it. And what is this truth that has to be moved? Um, uh, this stone or something that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be truth, it's just this established thing that has to be removed for uh, the people to access this, um, this life-giving um, water which represents the Word of God within. Uh, and and we take a look at each of these things and we just start to dissect what are the elements? What el what what could their remez, remez be? And the next thing that we look at is we say, what about the flocks? What are flocks? Psalms 107, 41 says, He sets, yet sets he the poor on high from affliction and makes families like a flock. So this, this <coughs> compares families to flocks. So who, what are these three flocks? Are they three families? Are they three groups of people? And it's interesting because Psalms 107 really helps us to understand this whole concept, this whole little mini story of the, the flocks. Because Psalms 107.42, the second verse says, The righteous shall see and rejoice. And we see what happens. Yaakko, right? He removes the stone and... He sees Rachel, right? And he kisses her and he's rejoicing. Now let's see if this is connected at all. The second half of verse 107, Psalms 107, 42 says, The righteous shall see and rejoice, and all lawlessness shall stop her mouth. So this is an interesting thing, because now we get this mouth, we've got the flocks, and the rejoicing. And we see that these patterns... In Isaiah, it says, How whom shall he teach knowledge, and to whom shall he give under, or wisdom, whom shall he give understanding? Those who are, are uh, 
wing from the breast. So he's talking about how who shall I give knowledge and understanding to? And and he says, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. He says, for here a little, there a little. And this is an example of here a little, there a little, which means that you take some a pattern that you see in pieces, just like we do uh, in the scriptures, and we plug them back in over here because they're connected. And we start to see what those have in common. And and seeing what two things have, how two things are connected is understanding. It's the concept. It's the heart of understanding. It's to understand the relationship between two things. So what I see here is three elements in Psalms 107, 41, 42 that are directly tied, in my opinion, to this little mini story about the flocks, the mouth of the well being covered, and the rejoicing when he finds Rachel. So notice that lawlessness, that it says she'll stop her mouth. So it it goes to this concept is that what is this this thing that's established that is stopping the flocks from being watered? It is lawlessness. It is it is it is something that even though it's not a truth, it is established. You see, we see this in religion all the time. There's things that people believe to be true, like the law's done away with, that is is something that is established. But it is not a good thing, and it is covering the mouth of the well that is allowing people to get to the water, which is the truth, and the spirit of truth, which will then refresh them and, and, and keep the families alive. And so how do we keep our families alive? Is number one, Yaakov, right, who is Israel, is going to remove this lie, this, uh, uh, this established uh, stone that is blocking the uh, people, the flocks from from receiving the water. Now there's a lot of interesting things here because uh, there's there's really four flocks when we're talking about this story because you have the three flocks that were already there and then what you have is you have the presence of Rachel's flocks, right? Who she brings and this is ultimately what triggers the removal of the stone from the well. And uh, the second letter in the uh, uh, the word fruitful is, uh, or, or not the second level, but the, the, the first, um, the first letter is the pay. So we have an open mouth. So this is talking about, now when we put it in context, the open mouth that is going to uh, go back, it says open mouth beginning revealed. So so what is this thing that that is going to be revealed in the beginning? What is this? And uh, you know what is this this water that you're going to get from the beginning that that didn't have this this lie um, being stopped up or it wasn't stopped up in the beginning. The very beginning that we see in the scriptures we see uh, Adam and Hava and and Yore Wahe spoke to them. And this was the first lesson. He, he the first command that he gives him that we know of. And he says, uh, he says, You shall not eat, you know, if you can eat from any of the trees, you shall not eat from that tree. In that day you eat from there, you shall surely die. So the first thing being said that is when you disobey me, you will die. And it's interesting when we tie that into Psalms one oh seven because it says that all lawlessness shall stop her mouth. And so what is stopping this? What is stopping this people from getting to the word of God? What is what is this this established thing that is obstructing life, the life giving word? And I personally believe that that is the teaching that we don't have to keep the law. Or we don't have to obey. This was the very first lie that was given from the serpent's mouth to Hava when he said, surely you won't die. But God said you will die. So some, the very first problem is somebody started saying, reinterpreting the word of God and saying, no, there's not going to be a punishment for your sin. And, and also, you don't have to obey God. These two things were the first thing that, that kind of started the whole corruption. And we can see them presently in all areas of religion and man-made religion, whether Christian, Messianic, uh, uh, Jewish, 
it all ha there's all elements of it in all the different religions. Um, and so we have to realize that um, Yaakov, Israel, will come and uh, and remove these things, these lies. Now, from the beginning, the open mouth is revealed that we must obey God, right? All creation obeyed God. When he said, let there be light, light didn't say, eh, I don't feel like it. I don't think that's what you meant. Surely there doesn't have to be light. It, it didn't work that way. Creation obeyed law. And when he says, let there be light, the light is the law. Um, as it says, the Mashiach is the light, and Mashiach uh, is uh, perfect, and Mashiach is truth. And it also says in the scriptures that the law is light, and Proverbs 6.23, and the law is perfect, and the law is truth. And the very first thing that we see is, we see the law given, and the law is true. This is the open mouth from the beginning revealed. It's going to be revealed through the end. Now, what happens? How is this How is this tied in to the wells coming around the flocks? Notice what he says. They won't move the rock until all the flocks are gathered, which says that this truth, that, that there's been this ongoing lie going on that's going to be revealed. And who's going to do it? Yaakov is going to remove this. And it's going to come, ultimately, it's going to water the flocks of Rachel, the flocks which are ultimately going to be Yaakov's, and that his flocks ultimately are Israel. So he will water his flocks. And this is the message that he will come, I believe, with, which is that we have to obey God. That, that, that if you have a well with a rock on top of it, it's good for nothing. You don't get any water out of it. It defeats the purpose. And in many ways, we, there's a lot of people running around the Messianic movement, even, even uh, with baggage from Christianity and different things that are saying somehow that it's really about salvation. It's not about obedience. And I totally disagree with that. The uh, salvation is obedience. Mashiach is salvation, right? Yahushua. Salvation of Yah. And how would you explain who Mashiach is what was he? What defines him versus any other man walking down the street? Oh, it's that he obeyed, he constantly obeyed the word of God, even to his, as it says, unto his death. This is what is most significant about him more than any other thing. And if you remove that, I don't know what you have left. So his constant obedience to God, even unto death, uh, and his obedience, not just in the letter, but in the spirit of the law, is what makes him Mashiach. And so what we see is that, you know, I, I guy got in an argument with me last night. And he's like, no, there's no other way than Jesus or, or Yeshua or whatever. And, and it's like, and I said, well, I'm not in an argument with that. And he goes, the law doesn't bring salvation. And I said, hmm. If he said, if it says that that Yahushua is the Word, right? The Word in context at that time when that was being said, the Word of God was the Torah. That was, there was no New Testament when those words were said. So, the Word of God, and not saying it doesn't include that, but in context of when it was being said and when it was written, the Word of God. All of Mashiach's followers had a Torah in front of them. They had a, a Tanakh, the old what we call the Old Testament. This was and particularly the word of God was the foundation was the Torah, the five books of Moses. And when it says he is the word and the word made flesh, I mean, all that is saying he's the walking, living Torah. And so to say that he's salvation and he is the Torah, the living Torah, then you can't say that the Torah isn't salvation. The Torah is salvation. As a matter of fact, now that doesn't mean when you get into it, the problem where people get confused is that there's the letter of the law, as, as, as uh, Paul talks about, and the spirit of the law. And the letter and the spirit must be combined, right, to have a living soul. When we go back to Genesis and we go to the very beginning, we took the dust of the earth, right, the physical, the flesh. And then the spirit, he breathed in the nostril, the breath of life. And when those two were put together, right, we're a flesh and spirit creature. It says, Adam became a living soul. That word living, right? This is very important to this concept. Because when he asked Kepha, he said, Mashiach asked Kepha, he said, Who do you say I am? He says, You are the son of the living Elohim. There's that word living again. Which means 
It is the combination of the flesh and the spirit, the two witnesses, right? Heaven and earth. In the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth. This was the physical things and the spiritual things. When you brought them together, you have life. That creates a model for us that all truth is established by the two witnesses. So the two witnesses are together. In other words, also his flesh and his spirit were ihad. Why well, he says he's ihad. And that, when the inside of the cup, as he says, is clean, the outside will be clean. That means that that you'll know a tree by its fruit, right? If he is that tree, then the fruit will be on the outside because he is that tree on the inside. All these patterns, they keep repeating to say the same thing. But for something to be living, he says not the, the, the hearers of the law, but the doers, right? So it's one thing to, to hear it. It's one thing to, to study and see the physical, the letter of the law, right? But you have to have the spirit of the law even in your actions has to bear fruit. See, you can bear fruit by just a letter. I can put a seed seed on and not be keeping the spirit of the seed seed, which is to have my reminder when I'm ready to go astray that I need to stay on track with God's commandments. And so, and then when I want to do that because I love God, now I've kept both the letter and the spirit of that commandment uh, to not let myself, as it says, go whoring after my own lust. To, to put God before my own desires. That is the spirit of the commandment of the tzitzis. So you can wear long tzitzis all you want, as the Pharisees did. But they did, they, in that sense, they were keeping the letter of the law. But why does he say to him, he says, none of you keeps the law. Because the law isn't just the letter. The law, just the letter, right? Solomon, when you divide the baby, right? You cut him in half, you know, the baby dies. The Word of God is living. That's what Messiah stands for. He said, "Look, I'm the living Word of God. This is this is what this is what He was, and this is what He exemplified." And uh, and so it was the law, the Spirit of God, He in the flesh. That was our example. This is how it's supposed to be. That you got to put the two together. And this teaches us a lesson that that we can do it and that we should do it and that life comes from that and blessing and, and fruit even though you may be persecuted because of it. So all this ties into this week's parashat when we see that um, this these flocks you know when that when that flock of Rachel which ultimately represents future Israel um, comes uh, and, and Yaakov removes that and kisses and he finds his bride. Uh, he finds the one he's going to be one with. That Israel is going to be one with those who obey God. Who don't listen to the serpent. Who don't believe that obedience to God doesn't matter. And so next we get into the little part about then what's that mean to be fruitful? We get into the little barrenness issue like Rachel. And we see in Psalms 107... Uh, 33, it's very interesting how all, all of this, Psalms 107, you know, cover each part of this parish art. Um, so you have verses 41, 42 talking, in my opinion, about what's happening around that well. And then it goes on further in, in or earlier in 33, it says, he turns rivers into a wilderness. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what's it mean when God makes a woman barren. And the water springs into dry ground. So there's that well that turns into dry ground. A fruitful land into barrenness, right? So here we have that key word again. Notice that key word, fruitful. And, uh, and barrenness. So this is one of the big messages of this week's parashat. It says, for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. So now he says, why does this barrenness happen? It's because of the wickedness that is within them. So again, this goes to the message of the Pharisees, which is that there was a wickedness inside them. It wasn't that they were even doing outwardly things, right? But it's the inward things that we're also lacking. And so therefore, you don't have life when you just have the dust of the earth. You got no spirit breathed into it. There's a problem on the inside. There's something lacking on the inside that's keeping you from life. And so if you look at this, uh, it's just like the latter. This is like us breathing in and breathing out. Like if the spirit is the ruach is breath in Hebrew, right? We breathe in, we breathe out. When we're breathing out, 
that breath is going away from us and then we're bringing in this is like the people going up and down constantly with God closer to God making a good choice making a bad choice making a good choice making a bad choice this model of our life is this constant thing and, and what choices will we make how will what will our life what will paint picture will this uh, paint of our life all the choices good and bad that we've made so we see here it says then in 35 it says so we got barrenness because there's a wickedness inside her. So there's something wrong inside her. Now, if we look at Rachel, it says in the verses, it says that that um, it says when El Yoda, it says when Elohim saw that Leah was hated, he closed up. Right, um, Rachel, Rachel's one, and and opened up. Um, uh, Leah's. So we see that there's this thing, that there's this problem, I think, with Rachel. Um, and this is a problem, the wickedness that says, as for the wickedness of them that dwells therein. So I think there was something wrong there. And because of that, her womb was closed up, just like it was uh, earlier, I think it was with Avimelech. Uh, no, or maybe it was Paro, uh, where it said that when, when he had Avraham's wife, that the wombs, I think it was one of them, <laughs> they, they do the same story, so like you, sometimes you can, can confuse the two because they both were like, ah, she's my sister, and oh, they take some, and then why didn't you tell me it was your sister? Anyway, one of those occurrences, it says that he closed up the wombs uh, of the people, so uh, we see this because there was a little bit of a wickedness among them, um, because they had taken the wife of Avraham, and uh, even though they didn't know, it was still being held. There was something within them that wasn't right. In that case, it was that uh, that uh, they had Abraham's wife among them. Um, in this scenario, what we see though is that if you fix that situation, then that will uh, he will open the womb. So it says in verse thirty-five, it says he turns the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs, and there he makes the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation. So this is painting the picture of the city for habitation of the womb. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesses them also, so that they are multiplied greatly and suffer not their livestock to decrease. So, so now this is about having children bring forth fruit. So it's interesting. Now we see the gathering in the revelation. And what happens? Yisrael is going to be gathered, right? This Ephraim, we look at the story of Ephraim in the northern house and the scattered houses of Israel. It says from east, west, north, and south. Wasn't that interesting? That's four directions. They're going to come, and you can see in this story of the well that once the fourth, right, is gathered, then, as or as they approach, I should say, this is what causes the stone to be removed from the well so that they can drink and they'll be the first ones to drink and uh, but once the stones are removed all of the flocks can be watered so we see this pattern and I believe this is the pattern of or prophetic of Ephraim that when Ephraim returns uh, they'll be watered with the Word of God they'll be finding the spirit of obedience and that's what will bring them back and that's what will also cause uh, jealousy among their brethren whether it be Jews or Christians or even Messianic because when you start coming saying that that we have to obey this stuff and that this is the important thing and 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 you're not saying oh it's for salvation it's for it's for anything else but it's it's because we need to obey uh, Elohim this is the important thing that we have to do and and everything else is secondary what you'll find is you'll you'll provoke your your brothers who say they're following God to jealousy uh, the people around uh, um, the well will probably be as maybe the other flocks were jealous when he removed the stone and watered Rachel's flock and they'd been there first right who are these people to come up out of nowhere and get to go first in drinking water but it was Yaakov who removed the stone and so the last part we'll see what is this stone what was this that was blocking up people from getting um, 
to the waters. What was this rock of offense? And in Isaiah 8, 14, it says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, right? That's within his disciples. And I will lay or I will wait upon Yoriwahe that hides his face, right, from the house of Yaakov, and I will look for him. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, notice the difference between the two. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, where, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people. So now that's it implicating uh, Ephraim who is scattered, lo and me, one of the curses, not you shall not be my people, but are now the people of Elohim, which had not obtained mercy. That's the second curse, right? Lo Ruhamah, no mercy. These are the curses brought upon the northern house of Israel, Ephraim, as they're called. But now have obtained mercy. So we see in First Peter 2.10 uh, a little tie-in that this is referring to. Uh, the return of Ephraim, and it's interesting when you compare Isaiah, I'm sorry, I, I was reading Isaiah and 1 Peter, and I didn't tell you when I changed. It's Isaiah 8, 14 through 17, and then 1 Peter 2, 7 through 10. Both of them are talking about this, this rock, and in this case, it is the truth, and what you see is this pattern um, that there was something, the rock that offended, it's it's almost the, the inverse of the rock, which was holding up there. The, 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 the rock of offense to the people who love his Torah is people is 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 when people say you don't have to obey God. That's a rock of offense to somebody who loves God. And on the other side, the rock of offense for the people that's that that um, keeping people from the word of God for those are who don't believe you have to obey is that somebody Ephraim comes along and says you do have to obey that's their rock of offense so it's interesting that we're just two sides of the coin and this is really the argument that people are going to get into and this is the foundational argument that that people will get in over and over again and that has to be dealt with is that some people are going to come back and say you have to obey and that's the goal and other people are going to say no you know you don't have to obey. And, and and to me, that's offensive because I just don't agree with it. But to others, I'm offensive to them because I say that obedience is the purpose of the Bible. Obeying God. People say, oh, it's not this. It's that. It's, it's being under grace. It's salvation. It's all these other things. They're saying all these things that in my mind doesn't make sense because grace is obedience. Like, grace is a fruit of your willingness to obey. You know, before the law was given to Israel, right? They were just asked to obey one thing. Go get a lamb. Hold it up for those many days. And then put the blood on the doorpost. They hadn't been given all the law. But if they did that, if they were willing to obey God and identify with God, uh, which could get them killed by the Mitzrayim, by the Egyptians, um, that just was a sign, but it was still a small piece of obedience required even to show the sign that they were willing to obey, then they were under that grace, that favor, that saved them from the angel of death. It wasn't that they kept all the law, it's that they were willing to. There is your grace. And so many people say, well, I don't have to keep the law, I'm under grace. But that doesn't make logical sense to me because I'm saying, if you're, if you're not even willing to attempt to do the right things and to obey God, then I don't believe you're under grace because I believe that grace comes when somebody's willing, even if they're not perfect yet, but they're trying, you know, the Shema, they're, they're making an attempt, then I believe they're covered. 
that God's going to protect them while they're learning how to obey him. Just as he did with Israel when Paro and the Mitzrayim came out to destroy them. Because they were willing to obey, God didn't leave them to be destroyed. He protected them. They had still more of a journey to go. They didn't, weren't in the promised land yet. right? Salvation isn't entering into the kingdom. A lot of people mix that up. Salvation says, we're willing to obey you. And then we go and, and then God says, well, then I'm going to save you from your enemies. And then I'm going to teach you my law and save you. And you'll, you'll be under that salvation as long as you're willing to obey me. And then as I teach you those things, this is a retest all the time of are you still willing to obey? Are you still willing to obey? And then those people who, are, who will continue as Mashiach, he is salvation. He represents salvation. He also represents the constant willingness to obey all the way to death. Those people will go all the way. They will enter into the promised land. Many people were willing to obey in the beginning, unwilling to then um, obey as it, gone, as it went on, and they died in the wilderness. So, so people have to get a clear vision, in my opinion, of what grace is. Right? They were under grace the whole time they were willing to obey. They were under the favor of Yorewahe because the thing of glory is somebody willing to obey. That's the rare thing in this world. Avraham was rare. He was under grace. Why? Because he was willing to obey God when the rest of the world wasn't. Right? It says Noah, the first use of the word grace in the Bible. And Noah found grace or favor, same word, chen, in the eyes of Yorewahe. Right? And why was that? It says he was just and perfect in his generation. See, while everyone else thought... I don't need to obey God. There's no rain coming. There's no judgment, right? Noah was willing to obey. And because of this, he was under this grace, this favor. He still had to build the ark. If he didn't build the ark, he would have died like everybody else. Because you have to obey still. The same pattern over and over again throughout the scriptures. That's what we have to learn. This is that rock of, rock of offense. It's a rock of offense. My rock of offense is different than your rock of offense. Because my offense, your, your established truth that we don't have to obey the law, that's a stumbling block for me. I can't accept that. I can't go any further with that. It is a bother. And and some other people's rock of offense may be that I say that we absolutely have to obey, and that's the purpose of the Torah. That may offend them. They may not be able to go with that, and that may be an offense to them. But in the end, when we see that word fruitful, right, the open mouth reveal, beginning revealed. The very first thing, right? The open mouth of God given to man was a commandment requiring obedience. And the result of disobedience was death, period. Now you can sell uh, salvation. You can say, oh, well, we don't, we don't want to die, you know. Um, and that was actually what the serpent was selling. You won't, surely you won't die. Right? Even though you disobeyed, you're not going to die. That's what the serpent was selling. And he was saying it's okay to disobey God. There's, you can still get some kind of life even though you disobeyed without obeying God. I'm sorry, I'm not buying that message. Hava bought it, and I'm not buying it. And she fed it to Adam, and Adam bought it. And I'm not buying it. We're, start, we're trying to fix the same problem that was the first problem that ever came. And until Ephraim, and until Yisrael can wake up, and stop eating of the fruit, which is really just stop disobeying Elohim, then they're going to be in the state of sin, and their authority over their life is going to be saved. That's the father of lies. The lie was we don't have to obey. So Torah and being fruitful, right? Life is when the two come together, right? There's two Torahs. There's the letter of the law, and there's the spirit of the law. And the spirit is clothed in the letter. That is what you will see. Just like Yaakov was clothed as the firstborn. When Esau gave, sold his birthright, Yaakov legitimately, he didn't deceive him. Right? He sold his birthright. Yaakov legitimately had the birthright. And then he got the blessing. Because he wasn't just an inside man, as it says, a perfect man dwelling in tents. But he was also the outside firstborn. When he put on the robes of the firstborn, the righteousness of the firstborn, he did it. He didn't try and claim that, you know, that uh, he was going to get something because of his lineage. He made it happen. He had the fruit. He had the outward and the inward. And ultimately, he became 
Israel and the, and the blessings of God came through him and ongoing promise so it's been life from the beginning uh, the two witnesses heaven and earth truth is established by two witnesses life was the flesh with the spirit together and that is what we have to do to be fruitful and I pray that people realize that they need to have the not only the obedience not only the letter of the law but the spirit of the law and the fruit of that is obedience true obedience uh, all the way through that brings life till next time I'm gonna say um, may we all be fruitful and shalom